Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors and let you know that there will be spoilers ahead. Today on Classic Movie Review, we're taking on the Big Red One 1980. First time I saw this movie, I liked it, but I thought it had a lot of silly scenes. That was before I learned that it was based in part on the World War II experiences of Samuel L. Fuller. Fuller began working on newspapers before he was 18 years old. When America entered World War II, Fuller became an infantry private rather than taking the path of a news correspondent and being an officer. Fuller served with the 1st Infantry Division in Africa, Sicily, France, Germany, and Yugoslavia. After the war, Fuller worked as an author whose first book was released during the war, a screenwriter, and finally a prolific director. One of his first big films was The Baron of Arizona, 1950, in which actor Vincent Price attempted to forge documents that would give him ownership of the entire state. Fuller directed around 24 full-length movies. He produced, wrote, directed, and occasionally acted in many of these. Fuller was very active in the film noir genre. These films include Pick Up on South Street in 1953, House of Bamboo 1955, The Crimson Kimona 1959, and Underworld USA 1961. Fuller directed many great westerns including I Shot Jesse James 1949, Run of the Arrow 1957, and 40 Guns, 1957. However, he was most prolific in the genre of war film. These films include the excellent film, The Still Helmet, 1951, Fixed Bayonets, 1951, Hell in High Water, 1954, China Gate, 1957, Verboten, 1959, and the very good Merrill's Marauders, 1962. However, the one he was waiting to make was based on his real life war experiences and is today's film, The Big Red One, 1980. I want to give a shout out to Central Plains and Rambling RJ. Thanks for the input. Actors. The cast of this movie is pretty amazing. Most did well, a few faded away, and one had some success. And that's sarcasm. The movie focused on one squad during the war. The squad was led by a grizzled veteran from the First World War known as the Sergeant and was played superbly by Lee Marvin. Of course, Lee Marvin was a veteran of World War II in the Pacific. Marvin was first covered playing a stinker of a bad guy in the John Wayne Western, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, 1962. The son of my second favorite vampire actor and the half-brother of my favorite TV kung fu guy, Robert Carradine was in the role of Private Zab. Zab was essentially the Sam Fuller character. Robert was first covered in a John Wayne Western, The Cowboys, 1972. Director Fuller took a small role as a war correspondent. Fuller was first mentioned in the exciting film noir, Pick Up on South Street, 1953. As for the squad member that had some later success, it was Private Griff, who was played by Mark Hamill. Hamill was born in California in 1951. He attended Los Angeles City College and studied drama. In 1970, as an adult, Hamill began working on television, including TV movies. His work in film began in 1977, voicing a role in the animated film, Wizards, and the other film where he was a space orphan or something. What was that called? Oh yeah, Star Wars 1977. Of course he was in the other ones, The Empire Strikes Back 1980, Return of the Jedi 1983, The Force Awakens 2015, The Last Jedi 2017, and The Rise of Skywalker 2019, as they got progressively worse. But that Daisy Ridley can act a bit. On the regular timeline, Hamill acted in Corvette Summer 1979 and The Big Red One in 1980. He continued to work in movies and on television. However, most of his talent was applied to voice work as Hamill had a fantastic ability to create different voices. That being said, he was hilarious in The Machine 2023 as the furniture selling father of the title character. If you want to support the show, we sell merchandise like teas and coffee cups and stickers. The link is down below in the description. Story. The movie begins in France in 1918 during World War I. The sergeant, Lee Marvin, is walking in the no man's land between the two trenches. The film is in black and white. The area is destroyed with dead laying among the crater holes and destruction. Cautiously, the sergeant moves as he watches for enemy soldiers. He is near the wooden Christ on a cross statue. 
As the sergeant checks for living wounded, he is suddenly attacked by a black horse that has gone mad during the fighting. Of the 16 million or so animals that served in World War I, it is estimated that around 8 million horses and 1 million dogs died. The sergeant survives the attack, but the horse breaks his rifle before it runs off. An unarmed German, they weren't Nazis at the time, comes out of the smoke with his hands up saying in German that the war is over and don't shoot. On November 11, 1918, the armistice was signed at 5.30 a.m. and took effect at 11 a.m. So there were undoubtedly delays in getting the notifications to all the troops. The sergeant hides behind the cross and kills the German with his knife. The camera pans to the watching eyes of the wooden Christ. The sergeant returns to his lines and finds him to be empty. He slowly searches until he finds a captain shaving in one of the shelters. The sergeant explains his late arrival because he was lost in the smoke and about the crazy horse destroying his rifle. The sergeant works on a piece of cloth with his knife as they talk. Finally, the sergeant holds a small red strip of cloth to his arm and says it represents the 1st Division. He continues that he took it off a German he killed. The captain has the sergeant take a drink as the officer tells him that the war has been over for four hours. The captain says that the sergeant didn't know when he killed the German. The sergeant replies that the dead man knew it was over. In the conclusion, there will be a bit more about the origins of the division's patch for the 1st Division or the Big Red One as they are known. The movie switches to color, showing the big red one of the 1st Division as the first color object in the film. The narration begins with Private Zab, Robert Carradine, that the design was widely known by the beginning of the Second World War. It's 1942 when you meet the squad. The Sergeant, Private Zab, Private Vinci, Bobby DeChico, Private Johnson, Kelly Ward, and Private Griff, Mark Hamill. They are on a transport ship heading for North Africa as a part of Operation Torch. Griff is introduced as a sharpshooter, Johnson as a pig farmer with hemorrhoids, Finchie as a New York street kid, hey, hey, farmer. and Zab says he wrote the book, The Dark Deadline. I wrote it, baby face. Fuller based the character Zab on himself and also wrote a book called The Dark Page, which was made into Scandal Sheet 1952, which I've already reviewed and you can look up. The link will be in the description. The soldiers are unsure if the pro-Nazi Vichy French will fight against the Americans. After placing condoms on their rifles to keep the water out, they load into landing crafts and hit the beach. There was some fighting, but at least in the movie it ended quickly. Zab is shocked when Griff misses an easy shot. The squad spent some downtime near the sea. Fuller's first cut was over four hours long, and I bet he emphasized the time they were hanging around between battles. There's a reconstructed version that has an additional 48 minutes but I have not seen it yet. Maybe one day we could see the full director's cut in all its glory. Griff tells the sergeant that he can't murder people. The sergeant says they don't murder, they kill, like with animals. Can't murder anybody. Somewhere else in the desert, Sergeant Schroeder, Siegfried Rausch, a Nazi, is with the Afrikor. One man is mocking the Nazis and said Schroeder murdered an officer. Schroeder, heriting the sergeant, says he kills and does not murder. When the soldier refuses to follow orders, Schroeder murders the man. The Nazis move out from Kazarine Pass. Kazarine Pass is a battle where the Americans were soundly defeated in early 1943. In the movies, it is the battle that takes place just before Patton, George C. Scott takes over command in the movie Patton, 1970. The sergeant and the squad are on point in the Kazarine Pass. They see a boatload of Nazi tanks and infantry heading their way. The sergeant tells the men that they are digging in to let the tanks pass over them. They dig their holes and the tanks pass over them. There are blood curdling screams as the tanks roll past. I always assumed it was men being crushed in their hole. However, Fuller stated that this was the only time you could show your actual terror by screaming under the noise of the tank. Griff freaks out and begins running. The rest of the squad, including the sergeant, follow. The sergeant is hit in the buttocks and falls to his knees. Film historian Richard Schinkel said this was a recreation of how Marvin was wounded on Saipan during World War II 
when he, like Forrest Gump, was shot in the buttocks. The sergeant is taken to the Nazi hospital in Tunis. Apparently, he had been recovering for some time. When air raid sirens sound, the sergeant grabs some Arab robes and begins to leave the hospital. A wounded American soldier comes in and asks if anyone is from the Big Red One. The soldier explains to the sergeant that the division won a series of battles after Kazarin and retook Tunis. The sergeant says, this is Tunis. Suddenly, a group of Allied soldiers enter and begin killing Nazis. The wounded soldier pulls out a Thompson machine gun and starts firing at the enemies. In his robes, the sergeant is reunited with his squad. Zab narrates that the division will be heading for the invasion of Sicily. The sergeant and the four soldiers are the only survivors of the original 12-man squad. Do you know what they call you four guys? Sergeant's four horsemen. The group ends up on another ship on July 10, 1943, headed to a defended beach in Sicily. Another soldier begins mocking Vinci for being Italian, and the squad defends their mate. This beach landing is much more brutal than the earlier one in Africa. As they go inland, they have to face snipers. Zab narrates that the way to find a sniper is to send a guy out into the open and see if he gets shot. A new guy tries to make friends with the five by bringing water. On one of the runs, he trips a mine and loses his testicles. The patrol moves forward and takes cover in a cave. It is not long before Nazi armor and infantry are moving outside of the cave. The army artillery has not come ashore yet. Griff almost runs away but decides not to. Naval guns offshore destroy the tanks, a point of personal privilege. It is commonly stated that D-Day was successful because Hitler was asleep and they couldn't release the Panzer Division. But every time armor came within range of the sea, naval guns destroyed them during World War II. Later, the squad is sent out to find a big gun that is wrecking havoc on the advancing Americans. They cross paths with a young Sicilian boy transporting his dead mother in a cart for burial. The boy says he will show where the gun is if they get a coffin for his mother. The boy insists that they take his mother with them when they go for the gun. The gun is a self-propelled 88 or a Tiger tank hiding in a building. They have women working around the building as camouflage. The squad kills the Nazis and destroys the tank. The women fall on the dead guards and chop him to pieces with their scythes. The old women make a feast for the squad. At first, it looks like the Americans will not hold up their end of the bargain. However, the commanding general orders a coffin sent down for the boy's mother. In November 1943, the division was sent to England to train for D-Day and not to fight in Italy as they had expected. Once again, the squad is on a boat heading for another landing. This time it will be in France on June 6, 1944, D-Day. One of the replacements, Limchek, wants to trade positions for the Bangalore Torpedo Relay. The Bangalore was invented by a British engineer stationed in Bangalore, India. He probably stole it from somebody. The name would work as well if the name came from Bangalore. Anyway, the weapon is a series of tubes filled with explosives. They are assembled by a team of men and slide along the ground until they were under barbed wire or other obstacles. Then they were exploded. None of the veterans are willing to trade. Eventually, they transfer to landing crafts and hit the beach, and this is the worst attack yet. In the movie and in real life, troops were told they would face poorly trained and ill-equipped combat rejects. Combat rejects sure know how to lay down fire. The Nazis were given a similar line by their commander. The passing of time during the landing was shown on a dead man's watch as the body floated in the bloody surf. The squad is pinned down on the beach and has to do the Bangalore relay to clear an exit draw. Men were called one at a time by a prearranged number to take sections forward. Replacements are knocked off until it comes to number eight, Griff. Griff freezes at the end of the line, but shots from the sergeant force him back into action. He eventually gets the job done and opens the draw. In real life and in the fictionalized version, two events were recreated. First, Fuller slash Zab was assigned as a runner to tell the colonel that the draw was open. Following the battle, the squad is in a rear area and Fuller slash Zab sees Private Kaiser, Harry Lang, reading a copy of his book. How do you like the book? Damn good. I wrote it, baby fish. This was the first time Fuller slash Zab discovered that his mother had sold his book. 
Because Zab met Kaiser by seeing the book, Kaiser was the only replacement taken in by the surviving four. Near the Christ on the Cross statue seen in the First World War scene, Schroeder and his Nazis set up an ambush near a broken tank. Schroeder has his men lying in and around the tank, pretending to be dead. Schroeder climbs up the back of the cross to oversee the action. Zab narrates that the sergeant is acting strange as they move towards the area where he fought in World War I. The squad sees a 1st Division monument to the battle dead and mistakenly think it is from their war. Kaiser is sent forward to scout the tank. Kaiser, being inexperienced, misses the planned ambush. The Nazis let Kaiser return to his squad safely. The sergeant and the others come forward. The sergeant recognizes that it's an ambush because they have infantry uniforms in the tank. He kills the men inside the tank with his knife. The sergeant pretends to call the company commander and says he is Sergeant Possum, indicating that someone is playing dead. He pretends they were ordered back to bring the entire platoon forward. The Nazis speak English, and the trick works as the greedy monkey waits for a bigger prize. The squad starts heading away, and the sergeant tells them it is an ambush. Kaiser opens fire first, and they kill most of the Nazis. Some of the squad's replacements are wounded. In a war film trope, a close-up of a Nazi belt is shown with the phrase, God is with us. After the battle, a wounded Frenchman arrives on a motorcycle with a young woman who is in labor riding in the sidecar. You're going to deliver a baby. What baby? Let's go. Johnson and the sergeant help the woman give birth inside the tank. They use condoms for gloves, cheese wrappings for face coverings, and ammo belts as stirrups. Schroeder waits and slips away when it's safe. The squad was sent to Belgium in September 1944. They are tasked with killing a spotter that is inside a monastery. The building is being used as an insane asylum, and a female underground fighter is inside to help. Walloon, Stephanie Audran, helps the squad enter the asylum as she cuts the throats of several Nazis. There are a lot of Nazis and a gunfight breaks out. The squad wins the fight. A mental patient grabs a machine gun and begins shooting people screaming, I am sane, I am sane, I am like you, I am sane. Zab has to kill the man, but it raises some interesting questions about war. Sometime later, Zab gets a letter from his mother saying she sold his novel to Hollywood for $15,000. The letter said it would star Humphrey Bogart and Edward G. Robinson. However, the movie Scandal Sheet did not come out until 1952 and starred Broderick Crawford and John Derrick. Zab says he will host a squad party, but the guys need to come up with ideas. I think I'd like the most. Kaiser cuts off Kelly and says he wants to hold a big woman's butt against a frozen window and then spend time thawing it out. Later, the squad was in the Battle of Hurtigan Forest, fought from September through December 1944 near the French-Belgian border. The battle is noted for the Nazi shelling of treetops that would send massive amounts of wooden splinters downward. The squad has to move forward as they search for snipers hidden in the woods. Kaiser is killed by a sniper but kills the man before he dies. The Battle of the Bulge, December 1944 to January 1945, pushes the Big Red One back into France. By the end of the winter, the Allies have retaken Belgium. Zab finally gets a chance to have his party with food, drinks, and I assume prostitutes. The sergeant tells the men to keep their front sights covered or they will get a rusty bull. The squad is ordered forward to Falkenau, Czechoslovakia. The sergeant was the only one that knew they were liberating a concentration camp guarded by SS Nazis. The enemy puts up a tough fight, but the five prominent members of the squad make it through without a scratch. Each squad member is horrified when they see the evil the Nazis have undertaken. Griff chases one of the SS men into the crematorium. The dirty Nazi hides in an oven. When Griff opens the door, the SS man pulls the trigger trying to kill Griff. His gun misfires or is empty. Seeing the enemy sitting there in smoldering bones after trying to kill him for hate's sake, Griff shoots the Nazi. He continues to fire, at last understanding why he was in the war and why all Nazis needed to be dead. He keeps firing until the clip ejects from his rifle. The sergeant walks by in the most remarkable manner ever and says, You got him as he hands Griff a fresh clip. Griff eventually stops firing. The sergeant finds a young boy in the camp. He cares for and feeds the kid, 
but cannot save his life. The men are surprised at the sergeant's care for the young boy, missing the point that he has cared for them for the last four years. The boy dies while the sergeant is giving him a piggyback ride. That evening, the sergeant gives the boy a burial by a tree. Like a bad penny, Schroeder shows up in the dark saying the war is over in German. The sergeant takes the man down with his knife. Just as he does, the squad men break protocol and shout loudly for the sergeant. He begins to reprimand the men for noise and light discipline. They tell him that the war has been over for four hours. Griff tells the sergeant that he didn't know the war was over when he killed the Nazi. Again, the sergeant says that the dead man did. Griff then realizes that the enemy is still alive. The sergeant and the four men go to work and save the man's life. Zab says that the real irony of the war is that they have more in common with this Nazi they saved than all the replacements that died without them getting to know them. Zab says he will dedicate his book to survivors, the only glory in war. Conclusion. It was very late in his career when Fuller got the movie he always wanted to be filmed. The last directing job for which he was not fired was Shark 1969 and he was uncredited. Since Hamill was coming off of Star Wars 1977, they switched him from the role of Zab to the role of Griff. Griff is the most conflicted character but I still think Zab was the better role. The name Griff and Lemchek were regularly used in fuller novels and stories. The movie was primarily shot in Israel to get the right look for the film. Fuller remarked that it was odd to see actors dressed as SS or other Nazis take off their helmets and be wearing a yarmulke. As for the patch, sadly there is no definitive source for its design. There are two main stories. The first, is that the division would paint red ones on their trucks in England for easy identification. The second story says that a commanding general in the division cut a one from his red flannel underwear. It is said that a lieutenant said the general's underwear was showing. The general told the junior officer to find something better. The lieutenant is said to have cut a piece of gray cloth from a prisoner's uniform and placed the red flannel on the gray background. World famous short summary. I'd feel safe if Lee Marvin was in charge. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a review, write a comment. It really helps the show get found. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show on the site at classicmoviereb.com. Beware the moors. Okay, there'll be a circle and two boxes that'll show up here. Use a circle to subscribe. First box is a recommended video by the algorithm. The second box is the playlist related to today's movie.